Good morning and thank you for joining us online for our weekly Church at Home worship time on Sunday the 9th of August. It's so good that even though we are apart for a time, that we can be together as a church family in this way to worship our Lord together. Our elders are so very grateful to everyone who has contributed to our Church at Home videos. We know that there's been huge amounts of work that have gone into these Sunday after Sunday and we want to say thank you to everyone who's been involved in that. We're also really grateful to the members of this church family, how people of all ages have looked after each other day after day through these uncertain times. Today, we want to thank Ian McNee for opening God's word to us in today's service. Work is continuing to assess how we will be able to safely return to something like our normal worship services soon. Session will be meeting later this month to consider the available guidance and how that can be safely applied to our buildings. Please pray for the Health and Safety Committee and the work that they are doing towards us and pray for wisdom and for discernment to all involved in planning the reopening of our buildings. We are really grateful for your patience in this process and we will keep you informed as plans crystallise in the coming days. Now, join me as we say these Bible words together from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the land of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And before Ian speaks to us from God's word, let's say the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods. Who will go before us? As, as for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed to him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with the tilt. Then they said, these are, your, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. The Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you have brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have become quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with it it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, servants Abraham, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, to whom you have swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give you your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be in be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Let's pray together. O oh Lord of God, we come today and we give you thanks for your word. We thank you that it can instruct us that it can encourage us, that it can challenge us. And we pray now that as we do turn to it, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that we may experience your blessing and your help in the moments ahead, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want us to continue together to look at uh, the life of Moses. And you remember on the last occasion, we were at the point where Moses was being tested. Uh, he was being tested because uh, God wanted to make sure that as he would move forward as the leader of the children of Israel, that when difficulties and anxieties would arise before him, that he would be able to cope in the situation. And we've looked at how he had to go to Pharaoh, and eventually Pharaoh released the children of Israel. They moved out in the direction of the promised land and the first hurdle that they faced was at the Red Sea. But nevertheless, even though the people were grumbling and moaning that they should have been able to stay back in Egypt, we see that under his leadership, he continued to take them through the Red Sea with the help of God. And we move now to the next stage in the story of this journey. I think it's true to say that all of us at times have fear in our lives. And today we're going to look at the biggest test that Moses faced. I remember studying for the ministry. And after uh, going to college, as was the case in those particular days, students were sent out as summer assistants to different congregations. I went repeatedly for three years to the congregation of Craigie Hill in Larne, and it was there that I met Anne, my wife. 
I then worked in Alexandra Presbyterian Church on the Shore Road in Belfast before being called to Kilkeel and all was well. The installation on that particular evening was uh, a very inspiring night. It was surrounded by friends and family, people from First Antrim and Craigie Hill and Alexandra and Tom Blackstock, who'd been the minister here in First Antrim, spoke uh, and delivered one of the speeches on that particular occasion. And it was a great night. I went home, went to bed, and it wasn't long until the morning. And suddenly, fear struck me. What I realised for the first time was, to use a phrase, the buck stops with you. You're now carrying the can. There'll be good times in ministry and there'll be difficult times. Yes, there will be many people around you to help you and encourage you, but at that particular moment, that juncture, that morning, I thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to cope? And you know, in Moses' life, when times were good, they were good. But there were also times when it was bad and there was rebellion. And in all those situations, whatever the situation, Moses had to carry the can. At the point we take up the story today, the nation of Israel had been wandering through the desert. They were coming near to the promised land and they had reached Mount Sinai. And it was at Mount Sinai that Moses experienced his greatest test. It's important to remember that before Israel was delivered from bondage, the world was given over, the world in which he lived, was given over to idolatry and immorality. People, generally speaking, had forsaken God. Paul put it well when he spoke to the Romans, and he said, people who knew God did not honour God. And from the beginning, God, in his love for the world, had chosen to redeem people. He had called Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and through him all the families of the earth were going to be blessed. And God was now fulfilling that promise. He was leading the people from Egypt under Moses and he wanted them to fulfil the requirements that he put before them. And now at Mount Sinai, God was taking his most loving and gracious step thus far. He was revealing himself directly to the children of Israel. And therefore, it was no accident that when he delivered the commandments, the first commandment that he delivered was associated with idolatry. And he said, you shall have no other gods before me. During Israel's story at Mount Sinai, Moses assembled up the mountain. There were numerous times when he went up and down and he entered into the presence of God. He was instructed by God as to how the people were to worship him. But also he was instructed by God as to how the people were to treat one another. And on one occasion, when Moses stayed up the mountain for about 40 days, during that period of time, Israel, in the light of God's glory and his love and his grace for them, reverted to incredible behaviour. Israel had heard about the folly of worshipping false gods, and they had experienced the manifestation of God's power in lightning and in fire and in smoke and in the sound of the trumpet. There was so much evidence of God's presence around them. Therefore, it would appear to be totally inconceivable that at that time, Israel was now about to turn its back on God, spurning his grace and engaging in incredible 
idolatry. Let's pause for a moment and ask, in the light of their knowledge of God from the past and their experience of God in the present, why did they act as they did? Many people today could answer that question by just pausing and looking at their own lives. The children of Israel had knowledge of God in the past and at that time in the present. How many people today have knowledge of God and his working in the past as well as in the present? The knowledge that many people have of God is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came into the world. And many people know verbatim probably what is considered at times to be the, the best known verse in the whole Bible. For God so loved the world. That verse shows us God's concern for the world. That he gave. That verse shows us about God's gift and tells us of God's gift for the world. That whosoever believeth, that's God's challenge to the world, shall not perish but have everlasting life. God's promise to the world. And in the present, people have that knowledge of how God acted in the past. But yet, what they appear to do is they forget and they ignore and they replace what should be devotion to God with devotion to something else. Israel's ingratitude to God led to Israel's idolatry. And while Moses was in the presence of God, away from the people of Israel, the people started to grow restless and they began to doubt God's presence and his power. The cloud that was present continually indicating the presence of God around them was still there. They were eating the manna that was God was providing for them from heaven. Nevertheless, we discover that they made an image of gold and silver. They made something out of material possessions. One that they could see and that they could worship. And what was to some degree remarkable as well, that in the context of what they were doing, Aaron and later Moses seemed to accommodate the graven image that these people had constructed. You see, at that point, the children of Israel, they were not denying God's existence. Rather, they wanted a representation of God. And in his absence, when Moses was not there, they reverted in some respects to what we might call the pagan practices of the past that had been understood by them from the Egyptians. And they made the golden calf, and that became the centre of their attention and their affection and their worship. It's so easy today to refocus on things or alternatives that push God to the side. And these objects or alternatives become a God that we worship. It might be an engrossing sport. It might be an absorbing hobby. It might be a new relationship. It could well be a materialistic outlook in life. It might be our lodge or our institution or even the church building. I couldn't help but, well, in one sense smile but be saddened at a conversation I had with a young minister now. It wasn't Mr. Lawington. But uh, I had this conversation and he was talking about opening the church after the lockdown and how that 
not every pew would be able to be filled. And how that they were going to have to maybe skip a pew and have an empty pew here and there. And this lady said to him, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. If they close down my pew, I'll not be there. And I thought to myself when I heard that, has this woman lost her rocker? Does she really understand what she's saying? Because what she's saying is basically this, that the square metre that she occupies in the church on a Sunday is what is more important to her than the God she comes to worship. Because she has to make a choice between coming to worship or sitting where she wants. And if she can't sit where she wants, she can't come to worship. And consequently, the pew has become the God rather than the one that she wants to worship. We smile at that illustration. But so often isn't that true within the church. We lose our focus and we even lose our marbles over things that are so unimportant and things that are so irrelevant. And what was the response to God, of God to the people of, of Israel when they started to worship these false gods? We see that God was angry and his patience ran out. And in view of all that they had done for Israel in the past, revealing his power and teaching his people the laws and making known his love, they were spurning all this and throwing it back in his face. And this became the greatest test that Moses had to sort out. Yes, God appeared at that point to be making it difficult for Moses. God said then, I will make of you a great nation. In other words, God was talking about destroying the nation and starting over again. Because remember, he had said to Abraham, I will make a great nation of you. Was he now going to wipe out the people? And this word that he was now giving would have been a temptation for Moses to become the centre now of human history as the nation would start from him. And this was a great test. But Moses passed the test. In fact, his maturity was now complete. And this was contrasted to the immaturity of the times he had displayed earlier. Moses became a true and loyal mediator at this point between the people and God. In verse 11 of chapter 32, we read that he interceded for the children of Israel. He pleaded with the Lord on their behalf. His maturity was seen in his concern for Israel, where at the burning bush he wanted to opt out. And what happened? As a result of Moses' intervention, we're told that God changed his mind. But he did not reveal that to Moses until Moses had gone down and confronted the people in respect of their sin. And then Moses, after he had done that, approached God on Israel's behalf and actually suggested to God that he too would die with them if they were not spared. What can we say about Moses? He was concerned. And Moses' example at Mount Sinai is a picture, too, of what Jesus Christ has done. Because of God's holiness and our sin, God cannot allow the situation to be that we are in his presence in eternity with our sin. And so what did they do? Jesus Christ became our mediator between God and ourselves. And Jesus Christ reversed the curse of Eden. He became the mediator, as the Bible puts it, between God and man. Moses, as the years went on, had matured and growth and maturity should be the desire and the aspiration of all of God's people. I'm reminded of a story, I'll go back to my Kilkeel days, 
when I was in Kilkeel, and a member of this congregation at that time, Tom Martin, was the leader of a youth team with the Peace Presbyterian Church in Ireland in Kilkeel. And they came down in order to um, do summer work out in the caravan sites, and on the final Sunday of their summer work, they uh, always took the service. This was something that happened year after year. And during this particular year, when Tom was there, and he was as horrified at the situation as I was, at the service that evening, it was decided that there were three girls on the team and they wanted to put on a drama. Now, I'm not against drama, but what I can say is that that night, it was absolutely horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. I sat in the front row of the church and the sweat poured off me. I just wished the ground would swallow me up. The service ended. What do you think the congregation said to me about it? They said nothing. I never to this day heard one word about it. And they had every cause to say whatever they wanted. What I'm trying to put across is simply this. Many of them had a level of maturity to simply say nothing, realising that I was probably more embarrassed about the situation than anyone else. And that's part of growth and maturity in the Christian life. And sometimes churches can be a hotbed for people to complain. But we need to be given a dose and a vaccination of maturity at times when not everything is done exactly the way that we want it to be done. But Moses had grown and Moses had matured. And he challenged the people. And later, they responded appropriately. As the years went on, and as the story unfolds, Moses eventually was taken over by Joshua. You remember in the opening chapter of Joshua, Joshua at this stage was now leading the same group of people, or at least their successors. And one of the things that he said to them, people of Israel was choose you this day whom you will serve remember what he said he said as for me and my house we will serve the Lord and the people of Israel at that time they refrained in the same way and they said we will serve the Lord today who are you serving Have you responded to Jesus Christ, the mediator between ourselves and God? The one who died that we might be forgiven. The one who wants to give us a new life. And who wants to give us the promise that he will never leave us or forsake us regardless of what the circumstances are in life. Let me ask, who do you serve? What is your priority where do you stand in relation to heaven let us pray oh lord our god we come this morning and we thank you for moses and we thank you that you even put him through testing times how that at times he he didn't step maybe up to the mark as he would have wanted but he realized his error he confessed his sin and he changed his ways grant our father that we might learn from his mistakes and that we might join with him in his successes and may we know that You want us to follow you, to serve you, and to mature in the Christian life, and one day to enter into your nearer presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Ian, for leading us this morning. And thank you all again for joining us to worship in this way. Please don't forget to keep up with First Antrim on Facebook, on Instagram, and on our website. And if you need more information or help in any way, uh, the church office phone number is on the screen. It would be great if you could join us for coffee at 12 o'clock on Zoom. We'd love to see you there. Now be blessed with these Bible words. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Now let's bless each other with these words together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.